Welcome to security, cryptography, whatever. I'm Deirdre. I'm David. I'm Thomas. I'm Thomas. Yeah, you, you, you're, you are Thomas. Uh, well, we sure pretty sure. <laughs> pretty sure. Coming live from your new studio. It's, it is. It's true. I'm in my new place. I'm very happy. <laughs> cool. Uh, hi, we're back. Back from our summer vacation. And we're going to go tell you what we did on our summer vacation. Uh, it involved things like Black Hat and DEF CON and crypto and other things. So uh, this is mostly us talking about all of those and maybe some other stuff that caught our eye uh, since we last spoke. Things like pixel attacks, why you should deprecate 2G, why you should write your uh, your modem firmware in a memory safe language, and why it's annoying to call everything that uses classical crypto and post-quantum crypto hybrid, even if that means a different thing in every single setting that you use it in. Anyway, so we went to Black Hat, and by we, I mean myself and David. When did you think of Black Hat this year, dude? Mostly I just miss Thomas, but... Yeah. Did you Thomas guys is COVID? distinguished enough that um, uh, he doesn't need to come to Black Hat. People mm. come to him instead. Mm-hmm. He almost lured Thankfully. us all to come to Chicago instead of Las Vegas in August. I have a giant new front porch. We're going to have front porch con. I think Just I... people will show up and be on my front porch. It's going to be great. A yes. good chunk of my black hat was spent doing cabana con, including <laughs> at one point showing up to the wrong cabana. It's very easy to tell which cabana is associated with security people. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe next year it'll be porch well, con instead of black hat. You guys were suckers, and you guys both went to uh, Disease Con, and uh, I Did don't know. Did not get the disease. Got sick because we wore masks in the situation, so it made sense to wear masks in. I was also just not around a lot. I was going to and fro a lot, and uh, but yeah, I got I got COVID last year at Vegas. Uh, I did not get it this year. Magic, magical. Also, in so, early June, I made up a pre-existing condition and went and got another booster. Oh, hell yeah. You're smart. I wanted that. And, well, I'm waiting for the new, new one, the updated one. Anyway. But, yeah, we did not get diseased at Disease Con. It was nice. Um, my, my, the question I was building towards was, yes. did you see any talks that were worth seeing? I liked a couple of Black Hat talks. So, one of the headliners was yet another processor microarchitectural vulnerability specific to Intel processors called downfall. Okay. Before you go there, before mm -hmm. you go to downfall, uh -huh. I, cause the, I have the, I have the chronology for this stuff vividly. This is all what we did on our summer vacation and I'm going to keep the chronology here. So there's, yes. you're talking about downfall, right? Yes. Downfall was, it was like a, it was a registered black hat talk. Like it was like the reviewers reviewed it and all that. I think we knew it was coming. I think so. Right. Um, but that's downfall hits, Intel processors. Yes. We have some Intel processors where I work, but we have um, quite a few more AMD processors. And mm -hmm. most of our fleet is AMD Epic. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of what I think, I'm not sure, but I think was an embargo snafu. <laughs> um, <laughs> Tavis Ormandy found probably, I think, maybe credibly the all-time greatest microarchitecture it's certainly the the in my opinion the best microarchitecture attack ever uh -huh. um on amd hosts called he called it zenbleed for the zen architecture uh -huh. which of course happens to be most of my server fleet um <laughs> so this is like i think like 2 weeks before uh the downfall thing came out of black hat mm -hmm. or whatever there's zenbleed and zenbleed was amazing so <laughs> you've got the downfall thing. We should we should talk about downfall, although like I, I sort of barely understand downfall. Um, eh. But Zenbleed is is Zenbleed is freaking awesome and also okay. horrible, but also yeah. awesome. All right, we're gonna cover downfall really quick because I think Zenbleed is probably more interesting. Downfall is basically on Intel processors. They have these gather instructions, and when they're it's it reminds me a lot of like garbage collection, but like speculative execution garbage collection. So like you did some speculative execution and then the processor under the hood is giving itself an instruction to like clean up some shit it allocated on registers that it needs to get rid of. And it turns out that you can run like a co-thread uh, or hyper-thread on one of these cores and you can maliciously leak 
information based on what is being gathered up by the sort of cleanup instruction that is only on Intel processors, that's only used for its vector instructions, its SIMNI instructions, but also for its ANSNI and SHA-NI instruction sets, which, yes, those are its like built-in supposedly, I don't know. I think most people think those ANSNI instructions are constant time and not very leaky. Turns out they are leaky <laughs> on Intel. Um, they release some microcode patches. It's only Intel. It's annoying if you have any like super optimized, like targeting backends, finite field arithmetic implementations that will like be really fucking fast on Intel with vector instructions or, you know, some weird intrinsics you have. You might have to be careful about it. If you're a cloud provider, you turn off hyper threading, you turn off if you have a VM provider, you turn off that sort of stuff if you have Intel processors. But that's it. So I'm, I'm going to say this just so somebody can, after they eventually hear this, can correct me about this or set me <laughs> straight. But like one thing about this is um, Zenblade was released, like, I think maybe by accident, a couple of weeks before Downfall was published. And both okay. of them were, were released with exploit code or with proof of concept yeah. code or whatever you want to call yeah. it. Right. Um, well, in Zenblade's case, right. let's properly call it exploit code because it was exploit code. Right. Mm -hmm. Um it it really worked. He just ran the Zenbleed ex, you know, the, the Zenbleed explo exploit thing, and everything that was hitting Sterlan or Stercopy anywhere in your system was showing up just in text on your screen. Right. Uh. So Downfall also had proof of concept code, but uh -huh. all of the code that I read and in the paper they make reference to this relies on PT Editor, which is like a kernel huh. module, um, okay. which you would not be running. All right. Okay. Hmm. So I, I'm not totally clear on which I assume that this is just to set up the test environment and make things, you know, obvious. But like they they released a proof of concept thing that involved installing a kernel module, um, <laughs> which is like, OK, I'm just not going to install that kernel module, which obviously that's not like the whole attack. Right. But like I don't fully understand how exploitable downfall was in particular, just how situational mm -hmm. downfall was. So, like, if you if you read the downfall paper, they talk about like finding gadgets in the kernel, which mm -hmm. is like a, a classic like Spectre type spec X yep. thing, where like, yep. um, you know, there are particular places in the kernel where you can you know pick up leaked data from, right? Yep. Because of you know vulnerability to speculative ex execution. It it seemed to me reading the downfall paper that downfall kind of followed the same pattern. Like, you'd need to know what you were targeting. Um, and again, yes, you do. Zenbleed, you just ran Zenbleed and you can see passwords <laughs> on the screen. Yeah, downfall, you, you definitely know. have to target a victim process or thread and no. you want to try to be co-located or, you know, co-hyper-threaded on the same core to try to get the leaked stuff from your victim co-thread, basically. Yeah, you need to know, you have to target something specifically to get some bang for your buck, as far as I understand it. So yeah, Zenbleed sounds a lot worse. <laughs> Zenbleed is leaking a wide register, <laughs> correct? Whereas <laughs> Spectre and Meltdown and I think Downfall are leaking like bytes in memory sometimes, right? Like, like I don't even know if they're leaking in memory. I think they might be leaking in registers on the set. For, for Zenbleed, but... yes, it's directly off of the registers. Register, so... yeah, but but for like Spectre and Meltdown, you're effectively leaking yes. like from memory. And and yeah. Downfall is is Downfall a register or is it memory? No, my understanding is that Downfall, like the gather instructions in the like the micro apps that implement gather or however mm -hmm. gather is implemented under the hood in the microarchitecture, that what's mm -hmm. happening is that the CPU um, uses like a temporary buffer. So you, what you're doing is you're doing like a non-contiguous read. So you're like picking up bytes from random places in memory or, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And then yeah. assembling them into a single read. The CPU is allocating a buffer to do that. And that buffer is aliasable, is my understanding. Um, mm. So I'm, I'm, I'm really fuzzy on downfall. So again, somebody just call me an idiot online and tell me what the, what the right <laughs> way to think of this is. But that's, that, that's what I understand to be happening, right? Is that yeah. um, mm -hmm. the, the leak here is in a temporal buffer that's being used yes. to kind of add up the bytes that you're trying to read non-contiguously. Yeah. Zemblee is hilarious. So, well, this is, I think, somewhat counterintuitive then, but like, I think like leaking a register is just way worse than leaking memory. Uh, the, at the least if it's like a big register, right? Right. Because like everything is going through that. So you don't have to like find stuff. Uh, Whereas mm -hmm. it, with like Spectre and Meltdown, you have to you do this whole process to like 
find specific parts of memory and recombine things. Whereas like if you leak a a 24 byte register <laughs> that's like oh, always has that's primarily used for like comparing contiguous bits of chunks of memory. Like, yeah, you're just going to get useful stuff for free, whereas you had to put effort in. So like this Zenblade is yeah, Zenblade is a is a register file use after free. Like literally, mm-hmm. that's what it is. So, <laughs> you know, if, if we're thinking in terms of writing assembly instructions, there's no such thing as freeing, right? The the analogous thing that we're doing with registers is clearing them. Like we're writing zeros to them. And so, like the the freeing here is um, as an optimization when you zero out a range of registers, the architecture, like the AMD architecture, will set a flag saying these registers are, are now zeroed out. They've been freed. Right. Which means that something else can just write to them because, mm-hmm. you know, the architecture is going to assume from that point on that whatever's there, it might as well have been zeros. Right. So the registers are freed. They get used somewhere else. Something else aliases that, that, that those same underlying physical registers to, you know, some logical register somewhere. Right. They get written to just like any use after free attack. Right. Mm-hmm. But the thing that freed them was executed speculatively. Right. So yeah. you mispredict the branch, you roll it back. And they didn't catch all the corner cases for it. So there are places where you can roll it back and whatever data was written into the the, the XMM registers is still there after the uh, the mispredict rolls back the zeroing out. Um, so it's like you're, yeah. you're basically you're tricking other processes into writing into registers that you're going to get to see. Just awesome. Just really awesome bug. <laughs> the, the point was made on the orange site that <laughs> OpenBSD, for instance. So the the huge problem with Zenbleed is that modern libc's all vectorize their string instructions, right? Mm-hmm. Because these are all operations where you're doing things with like a bunch of bytes at the same time. They, most of them mm-hmm. vectorize pretty nicely, right? Yes, mm-hmm. um, that is a good thing so, to do. Yeah. yeah. So it makes a lot of sense if you're dealing with a string and you have like, you know, registers that you can load 16 bytes at a time into, you just load the string into it, then do vector operations on it, right? So all of the libc string and buffer operations for Microsoft and glibc go through these XMM or the you know, the AVX registers, whatever they're called. I always forget what they're called, uh-huh. right? But like yeah. the, the wide XMM and YMM registers, they all of yep. the string data that you're dealing with in a program is going to go through those registers. Cool. You basically get to like sniff every string that's going uh-huh. through the CPU. Um, which again, like you run that you you type make and you get like a little Zenbleed <laughs> executable and then you type dot forward slash Zenbleed and there's like passwords on your screen. So it's, it was amazing. <laughs> it seems like like way worse than like Spectre and Meltdown were. I think in terms of yes. like actual security impact. Well, and and I think that's because it's hitting these registers and not hitting like memory. You don't have to target anything. Everything's coming to you. You just sit there and you wait. I think it's fixable, though. Like, you literally just have to recompile your software, in theory. And you just say, no vector instructions, and you're you're done. You're Well, that's you- not really a fix. No. I could also turn my computer off. Yeah, but, like, it, as opposed to Spectre and Meltdown, where it was like, what do we do? It's like, well, you could deploy process isolation for all of your software. It's like, that's really hard. It's like, okay, well, mm-hmm. well we have to fix all the processors. Or, you know, deploy... Ooh. Yeah. I mean, AMD did a microcode update, right? Like, yeah. It, it's... yeah. So I think, you know, yes, it's very bad. But if you can do a, quote, software fix, which is recompile by telling your compiler, do not use vector instructions, and you get a little bit of a performance hit, your mileage may vary what little bit means to you. But that's tractable as a remediation, whereas Spectre and Meltdown, at least, you know, for the first year of it, it was just like, what the fuck do we do? And it's like, uh, you know, Chrome, deploy process isolation, <laughs> uh, you know, add repelines or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, have this very bespoke little gadget to protect your uh, your compilation. That's not as easy. Yeah. So. Well, we we did manage to deploy like process isolation too, right? Like Chrome did this. Wasn't Chrome that had already in... been working on it. Site yeah. isolation was in flight and then it got accelerated yeah. and released with perhaps a larger performance impact than it might have uh if it like just went at the regular pace of things yeah. but, but all of that has been like since clawed back like clawed um, back yeah i i mean uh, uh all of the performance impact of site isolation oh, has God, been mitigated cool. by future performance improvements great however every time uh chrome gets like 10 percent faster users open 10 percent more tabs and websites <laughs> get 10 percent slower and yep. so everything just feels like it gets worse over time but, but yeah that, i'm just making the point that 
that's not an easy lift. That was like a major architectural endeavor for your large software application. So yeah, but also the only software that it applies to is like web browsers, and they did it. Like even yeah. like right. Firefox and and Safari have done yeah. various forms of this as well. Uh, I would say like that's largely mitigated. I can I can feel like three platform security and web platform security people staring at me sideways while I say that. But like, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> so what else? What else? What else was a black what hat? What else did we like... do? Um, okay, so the other one that uh, really tickled several of my favorite things was uh, the Android. I think it was the Android Red team was like, oh, we found that the Pixel modem firmware. I think it was the Pixel Six modem firmware had an out of bounds or out of band memory error or two out of bound uh, two CVEs. And they were able to leverage these two with a malicious uh, mobile base station to force a downgrade to 2G mobile security. And using these memory safety vulnerabilities in the modem firmware with the insecurity of 2G as a protocol, they were able to like shove several, I think like 200 bytes, 256 bytes arbitrarily into the heap and overwrite uh, stuff in the heap and able to just like get a full on foothold in your pixel. And so then when you switched off of your malicious base station to a, you know, a reliable trusted base station, they still had a foothold on you. And so in their demo, they were able to be like, oh, you're trying to reset your Twitter password or X Twitter password. We're able to intercept all of your, you know, security codes and, and everything. We're able to overtake your account or, you know, that was a very, um, in my opinion, low stakes demo of what they would be able to do when they have like a full on foothold in your pixel device. So this is so like, that was this fun. is a vulnerability in the baseband? Yes, yes. But they were able to force by setting up a, uh, a malicious base station, they were able to force you to downgrade to 2G and that's how they were able to exploit it. There were two, like two CVEs and they were out of band or whatever. And at the very end, of, like the whole talk, I was like, so you one, yeah, two G's bad, but like you wouldn't have been able to pull this off if this was like you didn't have these memory safety issues in the firmware implementation of the modem. And at the very last slide of their presentation, they're like, "Yep, we're experimenting with rewriting this modem firmware in Rust." I'm like, "Yay!" <laughs> so uh, hold hold on a second. I'm just I'm just trying to get my head yeah. around it, right? So they yeah, have yeah, yeah. they've got code execution in the baseband on the Pixel phone. What is that? Yeah. What does that directly get you? Um, it just gives you. How do you go from there execution. to Twitter? Is, I guess my question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm. Uh, I'm trying I to think remember. you mean X. Yeah, X Twitter or <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Attacker fully. How do you go from there to Twixter? The attacker fully controls up to 255 bytes written into one byte buffer on the heap. Allows us to overwrite heap header of the next adjacent chunk with fully controlled data. Uh, allow them to write a limited number of controlled bytes in the heap and yeah. corrupt adjacent e objects. In yeah. the baseband. Yep. Yes. But from there, they're getting, then, what, are they just like, can they just watch 2G SMS messages or something? Or I think is that so, what it is? because I forget if it was SMS or if it was uh, TOTP. I guess it, was, it must have been SMS. I forget from the demo. Um, but yeah, they, like, they were just getting an authentication challenge that was not FIDO. And uh, they were able to intercept it. And they're like, ha, I have your Twitter account now. If there's like any memory mapped I.O. between like the baseband and the operating system, you probably can effectively create a use after free in the kernel. But I don't know the uh, what the interface is there. But I like, don't think if you they just went start doing evil things with it, like, I don't know. Yeah, my antenna went up because it occurred to me that we're talking about a code execution vulnerability in the baseband. And this is like just a classic message board trope, which might be <laughs> more true than I thought it was, right? But like the, the, the idea of the baseband being compromised is part of the design threat for the threat model for both the Pixel and the, you know, like an iPhone or whatever, right? Like they assume mm -hmm. the baseband can get popped. Do they? Like, I don't know. Yeah, so they, on an iPhone, the baseband is like a USB peripheral. It's not USB, it's H6, but H6 oh. is just, it's just on chip USB, right? So mm -hmm. there isn't any shared memory there at all. It's, it's, it's a peripheral. So right. in theory, if you pop the baseband on an iPhone, all your, I mean, you'll get control of the baseband, which is why I'm wondering if that's why the target is Twitter is because, or anything yeah. that does like, you know, phone system based authentication. That is, is, 
sure, if you do that, you can like you've got control over its connection to the phone system, which is right. very powerful, right? But you can't go into like you know Twitter's process memory and go read things out of it. Mm-hmm. Yes, it didn't yeah. seem like it was that. It was very explicitly we're doing an authentication challenge over a well a fishable challenge credential, not something coming in a, a completely different way. And it might have been. Yes, it was SMS. I think you're right. Uh, I think Android does the same thing too, and I can. Yeah. I, I think I can think of specifically who um, is responsible for that, and it's probably like in between the time that I said I was wrong and when I said that originally, um, actively mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> but this is just in keeping with our theme of being aficionados of really effective downgrade attacks, going <laughs> yeah. from three G to two G, and then using that to you know tickle a memory corruption vulnerability is. High quality, not as high quality as if they somehow managed to tunnel a 3G secret through 2G and then get the 2G thing to use that secret somehow that it exposed it to everything else. But mm, a close I second think, to drown. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to say, we all know the best downgrade attack is going from TLS 1.3 to 1.2 to SSL v3 to SSL oh, yes. v2. Yes. I mean, you're you're laughing, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not laughing ironically. I'm laughing appreciatively. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I like that one. It was fun. Cryptography <laughs> talks at Black Hat this year. So somebody yeah. uh, extracted keys by looking at fluctuations in your power lights. Oh, yeah. yeah. Did either of you saw that talk? I did not see that I one. I did not see that one. Um, so people in grad school, when I was still a grad student, tried that and... Mm-hmm. Um, I just absolutely failed, and then like also might have accidentally dosed the inter- the like network connection for for <laughs> Michigan. Um, but I'm glad that someone figured it out. Yeah, they were they were kind of trying to do the reverse thing. They were like, if we scan the internet and then we point a camera at a, a Ethernet port, can we figure out like <laughs> what this thing's IP address is? <laughs> I, I like that paper, too. That's very good. But we're all just from now on going to assume that if anybody can see our power LEDs, they can also read every string that's going through our, you know, XMM registers. I mean, the only thing that blinks on any of my computers is the tiny YubiKey Nano that's sticking out of my computer. And I don't yeah, even I know what those say. those lights mean. So <laughs> the one I have blinks like blue and red when you need to tap it. Otherwise, I don't think it blinks. Yeah, it just... It's doing something and it, yeah, it aggressively blinks at me when they're like, tap me, (laughs) confirm for your proximity, human. And then we had two crypto talks at Black Hat that were about wallets. (laughs) Yeah. MPC, TSS shock. Yeah, there was a threshold, threshold attack on, I think it was ECDSA threshold, which is a much more complicated threshold signing scheme than the ones that I have worked on, which are schnorr and very simple and short and they have different properties so i i it was funny because um they gave this result this research at a uh oh gosh what's it called a workshop at crypto uh crypto in santa barbara which was like a week after black hat and all that and it was very funny because uh i i remember seeing it for the second time and being like oh yeah I know these guys. I didn't know they were going to be here. Um, and then all the cryptographers in the like, kind of like crypto attacks workshop walked up and they're like, so what do you recommend we do to like protect against these attacks? And they said, oh, I have no fucking clue. Like, I just I just found the attacks. I'm not I don't have any suggestions of what to tell you to fix your crypto protocol to make it. I, if I recall, it was a sort of like we were able to observe somewhere between like a dozen and a hundred threshold signatures and that was enough to put together a forgery that would validate um or something like that and that yep that sounds about right like a lot of the the attacks on threshold signature schemes are basically like uh the most naive ones especially if you try to do uh thresholds not um not necessarily the one that was presented but other ones if you try to do just like a naive approach to threshold signatures especially with schnorr and especially deterministic nonces which people like for deter- for signatures for reasons just like you just do more than one and you just do a little bit of arithmetic and you fucking you can solve for the, the private key the signing key it's it's really ridiculous how you just get more than one threshold signature from honest parties and like a slightly not well built enough threshold signature scheme will just either spit out a forgery you can compute or spit out the private key uh, from a naive implementation. So it was kind of like, yep, this sucks, but this is how they classically fail. So that was fun. 
<laughs> did you prefer hearing it at Black Hat or at Crypto? Slash, did you actually hear it at Black Hat? I think I saw it very briefly at Black Hat, and then I saw the whole thing, their whole presentation at Crypto. I really wish they went into a little more detail cryptographically. They went into detail about their attack but uh, at Crypto, but it was just very funny to... It was in a session with a bunch of attacks against cryptography and them not having... I think they were better suited for a Black Hat audience than a crypto audience because they literally didn't have any sort of like, you should probably tweak it like so to make this harder for me. They didn't have any suggestions like that because they're they're much more of an attacker than a crypto builder, I guess. I don't know. And what was it like being in Santa Barbara during a hurricane for crypto? Fucking awesome because there was also an earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the hurricane was lame because we were, we were far west enough that I was like, is you know, is this your king? Is this your fucking hurricane? It was it was lame. It was a little bit of wind and a little bit of rain. And I was talking to my parents. I was like, this is a average day in Ireland sort of storm. And then I was like waiting for the wind to start or exist at all. And I felt a little wobble. And I was like, oh, I wonder if the wind is blowing. And then like I looked outside, I was like, oh, it's not wind, it's not really blowing right right now. And then two minutes later, it's like earthquake. And I was like, oh, great. <laughs> In the middle of my lame hurricane, I get a lame earthquake. Cool. I've I've checked all the boxes for my trip to whatever. For my trip to California. It was nice. It was nice to see people. It was nice to eat the strawberries. It was nice to be uh living in a dorm for a week. That was fun. I got to meet some old timers. You were yeah. talking about Threshold ECDSA, and yes. I tuned out, and you went all the way off the end of Threshold ECDSA, and somehow you guys were talking about hurricanes while yes. I was reading the last crypto thing from Black Hat, <laughs> which I wanted to talk about. Did you guys see the yes. JWT thing? Oh, I nope. no, no, no. I had not. I'm <laughs> I really bad about going to talks when I'm at Black Hat. Oh, okay. So, in, in fairness, last time I went to Black Hat, which was the one before the pandemic, so wow, it was a while ago. But yeah. last time, I didn't leave the hotel bar once. I my room was like at an elevator above the hotel bar, so I would like yeah. get up in the morning, go downstairs to the bar, hang out in the bar. I think we went out for sushi once, and then yeah. I would just oh. like you know spend the day there, and then go. It was my equivalent of a beach vacation. Is yeah. being in a nice hotel room above a bar, right? Yeah. But I didn't, I didn't, I didn't once set foot on the floor, the actual conference yeah. floor. So yeah. I, I completely endorse your strategy of not seeing any of these talks. But <laughs> yeah. um, so the the last one here was three new attacks on JWTs, which is a subject near and dear to all of our hearts. Mm. I remember, like, I remember being a little skeptical about this when it was announced, um, mm -hmm. just because pretty much every obvious iteration of JWT attacks is like the, the verdict among people like us, let's say. I was going to say mm. the verdict among crypto literate people, but instead I'm going to narrow that down to people like us, is that the problem with JWT is JWT is bad, right? Mm -hmm. But um, it, in the service of enumerating badness, we've got three new attacks here. One of them is confusion between signed, between RSA signed and RSA encrypted JWTs. Um, uh -huh. This is a wrinkle I haven't thought about because the idea of RSA encrypting a token mm -hmm. seems ridiculous to me. Um, but apparently, people do it, right? Um, I'm I'm outing my own ignorance here, right? But like, so it's <laughs> obvious to me. It's it's obvious to me why people would RSA sign, why, why people would use you know RSA signed JWTs. Mm. is way more convenient than doing key management, which is a topic I will get into when we talk about Mac Irvins at Fly.io, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I have a newfound appreciation for why people use public key signatures and tokens. Um, but people also, and JWT, JWT will let you do this, people also do RSA encrypted tokens, where the validation of the token is, does it decrypt properly? And That's so you, you can get situations apparently where like the developer will, like you have an endpoint that will accept this is, I'm saying these words out loud and I'm trying, the, the talk comes with actual exploits. Like the, he found these attacks, right? This is all real stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But like there's an endpoint that will take a token that is either RSA signed or is RSA encrypted. Like either oh, of those no. two things could be true. And then, so like oh, the, the, the vulnerability there is you can get stuff signed um, or you, you could, you could encrypt something with the pub, with the key for a signature and then by decrypting it, it'll verify correctly. 
this is all if you just piece together what you would do if you had a thing that arbitrarily use signatures and encryption with the same key pair. Yeah, like it's the obvious mm-hmm. set of things you, you would do. You get there. something signed, and then you feed it to something expecting yes. it to decrypt it, and then suddenly, like anything that you can get signed, also is you could construct so that it decrypts valid, and I think vice versa. Mm. Yeah, it's the other way around in this case. It's it's the you get it <laughs> encrypted and that and that verifies it. So that's interesting because the usual like textbook, oh, you screwed up your algorithms in a JWT is the hashed mm-hmm. uh, uh, is like HMAX confused with RSA public key, mm-hmm. where you end up using the public key as the secret for the HMAC, and then that's well, yeah. it's a public key, and so it it's validates. not secret. Yeah, exactly. So, so when I was thinking about that, I was assuming it was going to be some like small wrinkle on that. And it's conceptually a very similar attack to that. Um, the precondition for that of having an endpoint that is confusable about whether a token should be signed or encrypted sounds crazy to me. But OK, <laughs> it's JWT, mm. so whatever. Um, sure. We've talked about this ad nauseum in previous podcasts, but I think this is why I like we slash I was like, you can use JWTs, but you need to like hard code all of your parameters yes. and not accept other ones. Like, yep, is exactly yes. this reason. So you end up only having the one set that you care, which should probably just be like ECDSA signed ones. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and describe problem two. Um, <laughs> it's, no. it's, 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 it's difficult for me because I have a slide in front of me <laughs> that has JWS compact serialization compared to JWS flattened serialization. Um, So in JWS, there are two ways to serialize data. No. There's the classic JWT style, which is Uh base 64 strings separated by periods, Uh which is, you know, you know what you love it, right? Like that's, (laughs) there's, for, for, for reasons passing understanding, there's also flattened format, which instead of base 64 strings separated by periods, which in fairness is a stupid format, right? Yeah. There's just JSON of that, right? Hey, so it's easy to parse in a header. <laughs> you ha- you, but you have to parse it. So, or you could have you like, also just ins- like encodings and whatever. Yeah. Instead of doing that, you can just have a JSON blob where it's like, the first blob is this base 64 string, and the second blob is this one. There's key value, key value, key value, right? There are endpoints and issuers that will alternately use either or, right? So like JW Crypto, the JW Crypto library, will first try to decode a signature as JSON, mm-hmm. and if it fails, it will fall back to oh, no. dot separated base 64 strings. Oh, no. <laughs> It's they they really have gone out of their way to make a jungle gym out of this whole system, right? And then there are other things that only use the flattened JSON version of it, right? So you can sign, you can have a signed token, and then because of the JSON flattened format, you can also take a valid signature and then add a bunch of additional JSON keys to it. Um, oh. And it will parse it as if it was, oh, this is the flattened signature. The signature verifies. But then when you pass it off to the application code, it's like, oh, these are just this is signed data. This is great. Right? So oh, he calls no. those polyglot tokens, which is it's, <laughs> it's oh, like Jesus. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. This again, like every time that I've used JWTs, I've, I've, I've I joked about it's easy to parse because I've done my own parsing of that header. Because like yeah. if you have a sane JWT like library it probably isn't actually reaching into the http header for you and then like you can try and find some library to tie it together or it can be like string dot explode dot you know if error does not equal nil and then like (laughs) pass the three parts into your jwt library yourself Mm -hmm. the third vulnerability here is it it has high humor value it doesn't have high (laughs) real world use value but very high humor value right so in addition to being able to encrypt a token with rsa or sign a token with RSA, or authenticate a token with an HMAC, or whatever else you can do, you can also encrypt a JWT with a password. I, I, I don't know, whatever. Encrypted okay. how? So the, for, that, for, for that reason... With a password, Deirdre. <laughs> you encrypt it with a password. It like, is Hi, it... I'd like to tell you about David's DLP solution, where we <laughs> encrypt your data with a password. <laughs> Look, I don't know. It, it never even occurred to me to look at password-based JWT encryption. Oh my, I didn't even but know this was a thing. Oh. None of us did. And we only know it's a thing because it, the only reason it was in the spec was for somebody to find this and write this attack for it, right? <laughs> so 
Watch as it turns out like it's using like HPKE or like some super uh, it's not I mean, it, HPKE only became real like less than a year ago. So I died. But sure. Like if he uses a real KDF like on that password, I will be shocked. It's a real KDF. So I just don't understand <laughs> like how why wouldn't you just do that? Like like we have symmetric like HMAC ones. Like why do we need? I guess because you you're doing secret management by like remembering it <laughs> like i can't remember a 32 byte secret i don't want to put that in source i'll just remember that my jwt password is oh, a super well, secret God. password bearing in mind that this is not like the, the most world breaking attack ever I, I guess it's actually strictly speaking the most breaking attack of these attacks but i'll just give you the token headers for when you're doing password encryption you can see if you can guess what the vulnerability is here that he's documenting <laughs> right this is not me dunking on this talk this is this talk was surprisingly I, I was surprised by how much better this talk was than I expected it to be. This is good work. Mm -hmm. um, not that you need me to say this, author of this talk, but I'm just <laughs> telling you that I like this talk. So <laughs> the keys in the token header for this are ALG, which is just the algorithm that, you, that uh, you're using to encrypt the token with. right? Our friend. And then there's ANK, which I think is the KDF that you're using. I think that's what it is. I'm not sure. But there's okay. ANK, which is just another algorithm, right? There's P2S, which is... I think the password, password string, string, like the hashed password, ha the password hashed string. Hmm. And then there's P2C, which is the iteration count. <laughs> <gasps> so literally you can just tell it like, don't, this is like the, it, it, please what's don't the thing tell with me it's like 10,000, like, oh God. Oh, I don't know about zero, zero is, a, zero is a good thought, right? But the, the, the vulnerability here is you can set it to like 4 billion. <laughs> and then just every time you try to verify the token, it's not to do like solve bitcoin or whatever right it's <laughs> it's great awesome oh, so okay. it's a dos right but it's like okay. but it's 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 a very beautiful dos so uh yeah there's no range of valid count p2c in the spec like fuck. i mean I'm, I hate i'm sure somewhere in some spec there is a range of possible valid things it's like somewhere else it says don't use the same key pair with both don't accept both signed and encrypted tokens <laughs> Pick one. I'm sure that yeah. says that somewhere. So Tom Travort is the author of Three New Attacks Against Jason Web Tokens. It's online. You can read his web paper, uh, his white paper on the Black Hat site. Um, I like this talk. I'm happy this talk got accepted. This is good stuff. Um, thank you for giving us a solid 10 minutes of funny stuff to talk about. On this yes. Podcast. <laughs> there was one other crypto talk that I don't actually know if it was on the cryptography track or not. Oh God! Um, oh God! Okay, so this the, in his talk, a section from the spec P two C blah blah blah. It just a minimum iteration count of one thousand is recommended, but it does not seem to specify like a constrained range. It's just sort of like it is an integer. Yeah, there's your there's your <laughs> zero. No one's gonna do zero. <laughs> oh God! Yeah. So this goes back to a broader point of if you're using JWTs, anything that is a parameter in the JWT, Ugh. pick one and hard code it into your yes. code and do not read it from the input. Like just ensure that it matches your hard coded thing and then do the hard coded thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so uh, what else happened on y'all summer vacations? I got the greatest monitor upgrade of my life, which is that I now wear reading glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably the cheapest too out of all your possible options. It's pretty amazing. Um, I was gonna say, don't you normally work on a couch? Like, do you even use a monitor? <laughs> well, no, I'm with my laptop, right? But like, yes. Okay. It's still like this is far greater than any monitor I've ever owned. Is this like, way, yeah. way better than the Retina upgrade? <laughs> it's like I put the glasses on. And I'm like, this looks stupid. I look stupid. And then I took the glasses off. Like, holy shit, I'm a fucking idiot. <laughs> I can't believe I'm. I don't know. I don't know what I was doing in the months leading up to it. Clearly, not looking at anything. I think like my brain was just like putting the words together from the context cues and stuff. Like your brain can sort of sort out things. <laughs> um, you know, if you scramble up the letters, I can still read things. I think yeah. that's what my brain was doing because now I'm, I'm, I'm completely dependent on the reading glasses. It's great. I'm very happy about this. I have a much better monitor. What else happened in your summer? What else happened? Um, a cool thing that came out a couple of days, weeks ago. I don't know. Time, time's a flat circle. Google and I think Yubico, um, and some researchers at ETH Zurich implemented and designed a post-quantum secure variant of FIDO2, like a, you know, a post-quantum resilient, like YubiKey, basically. And this is, this is just cool. Like, there's a couple of interesting things about this. Is one, the design, which is, I'm going to go on a little rant about this in a second. Uh, it they uses a took, quantum processor. Uh, 
I'm looking at a picture labeled quantum processor. I have a feeling that's just a brand name. <laughs> they just love to call whatever. Names don't mean anything anymore. One nice, they used dilithium. They used the dilithium signing algorithm, which is related to Kyber. It's like one of the three things that came out of the NIST post-quantum competition that finished like a year ago or less than a year ago. It might not have been a year ago. It might have only been six months ago. Also, it depends on what you mean by finished, because they're yeah. like, we picked the things. Now we're still going to dink around for uh, for another yeah. year to actually standardize them. Not because they're going slow, but because after you pick the algorithms, there's actually still a lot of work to do. Yes, exactly. Uh, I think they came out with some draft specs for these three things literally a week ago. So there's stuff happening, but there's also more stuff happening with signatures. And we'll talk about that later. Basically, they nest these signatures. So they, hey, you have your message you're trying to sign, whatever that is, a challenge from, you know, your, you know, web service that's doing a, a 502 challenge to you. Um, and you need to sign it with, by the signing secret key uh, that corresponds to the verifying uh, public key that you registered with the service when you did your 502 uh, registration thingy dance. So the way they updated it is that you have your message, you sign it with the classical signature scheme, which is ECDSA, and then you sign the message and the signature, the classical ECDSA signature with your dilithium signature. Um, and they call this hybrid, and I guess it's technically hybrid because it's classical and post-quantum, but it's nested. So if the post-quantum scheme breaks, which seems to be, you know, We've had breakage of post-quantum schemes in the recent past. You still have an ECDSA signature over a message that you will have to verify as well. But you can verify the post-quantum one as a sort of a no-op if you don't turn that off. If your ECDSA breaks because of the quantum computer comes online, um, you will verify the post-quantum one. And the ECDSA part becomes a no-op or you just skip it. But it's just a blob that you're signing over. So there's that. This is cool. Uh, they implemented it. They implemented it in Rust. They were able to uh, get it small enough for uh, such a constrained hardware target. They only require 20 kilobytes of memory. That's a nice achievement because, you know, some of these, you know, lattice-based post-quantum schemes are a little bit big and, you know, we don't have as much experience on implementing them and deploying them for uh, constrained devices, uh, let alone with Rust. So that's very exciting. I'm mildly annoyed because we've been talking about hybrid protocols using classical and post-quantum primitives in the context of things like TLS or, say, Signal, anywhere you might use Diffie-Hellman. And the way you d use them in a, in a hybrid setting for that is you do your classical elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, you do your post-quantum, who's he, what's it, Kyber, whatever. And then you use HKDF from together. Yeah, you can cat them together and then you just take that blob and you HKDF them or do whatever your KDF is. They're very side by side, right? In this setting, they are nested. And I'm annoyed. <laughs> I'm not annoyed because it's a bad design, because it makes sense in the kind of signing cascade of what you're trying to assert and, you know, commit to with these signatures. So the, the post-quantum signature is committing to both the message and the classical signature. The classical signature is not going the other way around, but in theory, if the, the quantum computers come online and the post-quantum signatures are the thing that are long-lived, we're okay with that. I'm just annoyed that they're both called hybrid <laughs> because one of them is nested and the other one is not. One Deirdre. of them is concat and one of them is nested. I'm annoyed. <laughs> just Can pick I make a your different day name. even worse and tell you about another hybrid? No, is it a car? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, in crypto for, for post-quantum stuff, there's like a proposal at IETF, I think IETF, that was for like starting to talk about shoving post-quantum signatures into X509, uh -huh. which like, <laughs> but <laughs> probably going to happen at some point. But um, they were like, you know, to do hybrid there, the proposal was to mesh with the internals of ECDSA and dilithium to try and create a no. single signature that no. was somehow both out there. Yes. No, yes, no. yes. yes. No, in my veins. No, do not, do not pass yes. go. Violates yeah. oh, all the so fucking good. proofs we have. 
If mm-hmm. they fucking try, I'm just going to like just show up at their house and just be like hold up like a stack of papers that be like, where in here do you see this Frankenstein of a signature scheme? And the answer is nowhere. <laughs> and then I looked into this. The draft is basically nothing so far. And we may be able to steer it in a better direction. Um, before, I, um, I, I agree that's a bad idea. However, um, <laughs> before Thomas makes his uh, 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 inevitable comment about I, the IETF in general, um, <laughs> I will I will say that I do not think this is reflective of that specific problem with the uh, no, IETF no. for for unrelated reasons that yeah. I'm not going to talk about on the podcast. <laughs> um, related right. to internet and post quantum kyber in browsers. There's something on here? Um, I don't... Kyber is the chem version of Dilithium, yeah, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, okay, well, right. no, Kyber is a, it is the key encapsulation mechanism that um, NIST standardized. Both Dilithium it's and like Kyber are lattice-based, but I don't know specifically how much actual overlap there is. In the it's like the same group of people. Like, learn the math. Yeah. It's like the yes. same group of people, and like they, they came up with both a signing scheme and a key exchange scheme. I think that Correct. sounds right. Yeah. yeah okay. Um... Yes, because it's the Kyber crystals and the dilithium crystals. Yep. So we have Star Wars and Star Trek. We're all a bunch of fucking nerds, and all, Wait, are those all both, of the are those Star Wars and Star Trek references. Yes, yes. Kyber yes. is Star Wars and dilithium is Star Trek. And we had a whole series of uh, ring LWE lattice based things that were all Frodo and other Lord of the Rings related names. So we're all a bunch of fucking nerds. <laughs> One thing that does get complicated with the, aside from the fact that like these chems are just like big, right? Mm. Kyber 768 is, you know, 768 bytes and that mm-hmm. plus, you know, some crap for formatting it. Uh, and then, you know, Kyber 1024 is 1024. Mm-hmm. Because they're so big, like you can in like 1.3, TLS 1.3, if you're like, oh, I can do ECDSA and I can do like X25519, even though those are different purposes. And or I could do, you, you know, like you can just kind of shove all these key agreements into one handshake and it's like, yeah, it's 32 or 64 bytes. Who cares? <laughs> you, you can't really send Kyber 768 and Kyber 1024 in like a single key share. Right. Because, well, I mean, you could, but it'd be stupid. Right. <laughs> so you, so you kind of have to pick the Internet needs to pick one um, in general. And mm-hmm. there's disagreement among people of uh, whether we should be using 768 or 1024. Hmm. Um, but we should probably just be using 768. That's what uh, Chrome is doing at the moment. But yeah. certain stakeholders prefer 1024. Interesting. I need to go implement Kyber myself. But do you want a signature scheme that will give you 170 bytes for your signature? What I, I would love a signature scheme. So t- um, before I like get myself into trouble, I will just say I would love a <laughs> signature scheme that is post-quantum secure and under 200 bytes. Ideally, sixty-four bytes, but like you know, uh, I I uh, I still need to. We'll say roughly two hundred bytes for now. I still need to like sit down and come up with an actual rationalization for that number instead of simply pulling it out of thin air. Uh, we have a lovely isogeny-based signature scheme that's not complicated <laughs> at all. <laughs> that's less than two hundred bytes on the okay. wire. And it you can sign in about 420 milliseconds and verify in seven milliseconds. Just okay. How many, how many cycles does it take to forge a signature? Don't think about it. Don't think about <laughs> it. No, this one this one is uh, not broken to hell yet, but it is uh, it's a bit complicated. But if you're looking at Falcon and you can deal with that implementation complexity, like you should consider Skisan. So I, I guess the thing that here is NIST <laughs> did start another competition. Yeah. Um, well, they actually started a while ago. A while ago, but the like first round of it, the submissions were due like a month ago. Yeah. Specifically for making short signatures, because one of the problems is that for the last fifteen years or so, we've solved all problems of TLS by slapping another signature onto it. <laughs> so when you do a TLS handshake, there's anywhere between like five to seven signatures in the regular course of things God. because of SCTs. Plus yeah. your certificate chain, plus just signing the key agreement message. And yeah. if all of those were like a kilobyte yeah. plus, you'd be sending, you know, a non-trivial fraction of a floppy disk on the <laughs> handshake of every connection, which is just like clearly not feasible. Like mm-hmm. even Kyber itself is kind of not feasible in the sense that it pushes the client hello into like two packets 
mm-hmm. over the 1500 byte threshold for a single packet. And you can't even like we tried bit fiddling and cutting stuff out of the hello to make it smaller. It doesn't work. Mm. Um, hmm. And to say nothing of that, like uh, uh, what happened if we just swapped it all the signatures? Uh, so hmm. that will be a tough problem to solve. Yeah. We well, anyway, NIST here. is doing a competition for uh, shorter signatures. But like I, there's an open question as to like, I'm sure no, no offense to dilithium. I'm sure if we do another competition we could come up with something that's like better than dilithium size wise mm. because we had another three years in a competition for it but like does that mean we're gonna get a 64 byte signature out of it um probably not probably not um, could we get a 200 byte maybe i don't know i still think probably not from <laughs> i've this has been if i see a cryptographer roaming around i ask them this question and then i get different answers yeah i think it's quite early um the PQC signatures, they say the, whatever they're calling it, additional, the standardization of additional digital signature schemes. I don't know if they, ex- I have to go reread the the call, but I don't know if they explicitly say we want shorter ones. I got the impression that- They do, that- actually. Like Good. one of the okay. things they list in the motivation for it is that like certificate transparency wants <laughs> short signatures. So cool. w- one kind of fun thing about certificate transparency though, so like if you have two or three SETs per, per cert, right, you know, that's let's say three signatures, um, but the keys are we're basically pre-distributed. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of suck up a larger key size in the case of CT. Right now we always use, we use ECDSA keys, mm-hmm. but uh, the reason is you get the, the small signatures, but like if you had a 5K, I don't know, again, I'm making all of these numbers up, um, mm-hmm. but like you could probably suck that up with the pre-distributed case, even though that would be totally unsustainable and like yeah. larger than an X509 certificate right now, mm-hmm. um, public key size. I think if ski sign stays alive, it would definitely be very attractive for this. The public keys are small, like comparatively small. They're just kind of also just small. The signatures are small. The compute cost is coming down. It's just a question of like, We have never tried to implement these sort of algorithms in constant time before and like efficiently before. Mm -hmm. Like we still have like there's been some nice work published in the past six months to encourage that. But also we all remember what happened to SIDH and Psych. So I was going to say, have we uh, have we checked to make sure there aren't any papers from the 90s in a math department (laughs) that just fundamentally break our scheme? No, no, we haven't. Not to my knowledge. (laughs) <laughs> where, where in lit review do we do that? Uh, I don't know. There's also some like uh, alternatives of using like higher dimensional abelian varieties. The shit that was used to break uh, psych and C- C- uh, SIDH to construct a variant of ski sign, blah, 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 blah. But that's not the one that's been submitted to NIST. But yeah, it's uh, extremely attractive, but quite early days. Like ski sign's only been around for three years, so... I look forward to the episode of the show where we have the person on who breaks ski sign and explains Duh. the map that we'll never understand. No, they're just... Richelieu identities. That's what I. That's what I remember about this is Richelieu identities. Yeah, they're in there somewhere. I still don't know what they are. That's okay. I was told I would never understand them. Just there's a reason I together. did not uh, <laughs> uh, take part in that episode. Just think about smushing donuts together and whether they stay two donuts or they become one. Mega donut, and then that's your oracle. That's all you need to know. <laughs> now I have. What it. if I? What if I prefer my metaphors to be coffee cups? Is that still isomorphic? Yes, actually. Well, that's you know you have to actually just like punch a hole in the bottom of the coffee cup. But sure, we'll make it work. It's fine. <laughs> this is this is your introduction to higher genus a billion <laughs> varieties. <laughs> <laughs> While we're sort of talking about X509, I do want to go back to Black Hat briefly because yeah. there was one X509 talk that oh. there that was that took place there called a SSL Lippery Slope. Ooh. Um, for whatever reason, I have found myself explaining to people recently why Authenticode was a mess, um, and this is another reason that Authenticode was a mess. So Authenticode is like the thing that Microsoft created to sign drivers, basically, and other software. Right. So if you've ever clicked through one of those errors that you ignore, that's like this thing wasn't signed to install some software. Um, that's Authenticode. Mm-hmm. You may also know it from uh, Stuxnet had a valid Authenticode <laughs> signature. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, when you're checking for that, right, you don't have like a domain name to compare in the common name. Right. So you kind of just like any signature basically works as long as it changed to a root for mm-hmm. Authenticode. Problem is, how did you find a root for Authenticode? 
in ye olden days, we kind of just used <laughs> one root store for everything. And then we just applied key usage bits to various um, certs or signing operations. And then like, so if you're checking an authenticode signature, um, like Windows does this correctly, for example, but like you are probably using the Windows like root store and then you have to enforce that like the code signing bit was set on all of the certificates that go through it. Yeah. Otherwise, you could just, you know, get a certificate signed by Let's Encrypt for a random website, then use the key in that certificate to sign your binary. Oh. And because the root store is shared, if you don't check the key usage bit to notice that, well, that Let's Encrypt certificate's actually for the internet and not for code signing, then you can get your uh, uh, authentic code signatures to verify. Ew. Um, now, to be fair, Microsoft itself didn't have this problem, but some other libraries did. And so that's what the talk was about. It's like, you should probably check key usage bits. Huh. The alternate fix for this um, is to like to have dedicated PKI yeah. hierarchies for separate yeah. things, yeah. right? And then have separate stores for them. That would like uh, but not for legacy reasons, like legacy. a bunch of stuff will chain back to like some old root certificate created years ago that's uh, used for everything. Uh, and like, is that twenty years old or ten years old or? Um, I'm not even sure, yeah, but okay. uh, the speaker here, their name was Bill. I don't remember their last name, but they're <laughs> very impressive because they both worked full time at Microsoft and were still an undergrad, huh. um, as opposed to us who are just podcasters. <laughs> and Thomas, who just learned about glasses. So, like, mm -hmm. some people are it's going true. places. <laughs> I feel like this was a pretty good catch up. I feel like we're yes. caught up. <laughs> Wait, do we want to do threat model ETE for on the oh. web? No. No? I want to do it. Do I uh, do it in a different do that episode? next time. Okay. I, uh, all right. I think I'm going to probably end up writing a blog post. Cool. All, all right. All my things I can do next time. It's totally fine. Yes. Very good catch up. Good summer. Busy summer. Good summer. So we're back into it now. One might even say it was a cruel summer. Cool summer. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think we're back into it. See you soon. Hey, we haven't asked this before because we all like asking our audience for things. But if you would like to review us on the Apple podcast store or wherever you listen to podcasts and they let you review stuff, how about you give us a cool review? It's really nice and it helps people find us. Will we give them a coupon for stamps.com if we do that? No, <laughs> we'll give you thank yous. <laughs> Why do we want reviews? Because it helps show us up higher in like Apple and all the other, you know, podcast thingies that scrape from Apple and show us as like good. I thought we were like the cool bar and swingers that doesn't have the sign above it. You just have to know about us. It's fine. Review us if you want to like reveal us to the, the non cool kids. That's totally fine. Yeah. Or join in in the YouTube comments when because we do release episodes to YouTube and we get yeah. great comments like the art of how to talk about nothing or yes. these people are don't know anything about what they're talking about. Yes. Which I feel in like fairness. we're very upfront about yeah. the fact that we don't <laughs> know what we're talking about. I think that's how we seen. open every episode. <laughs> well, it is good to talk to you guys again. I look forward to our next episode, whatever it is that we don't know what we're talking about, talking about again. So, yep. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We'll f we'll figure it out when we figure it out. Okay, bye. <laughs>